Good morning. As you can see, I'm not wearing a white coat. I'm certainly not Dr. Steve Stites, the chief medical officer at the University of Kansas Health System. We gave him the day off today. He needed a little break. I'm Alexis Delsed, pinch hitting on this episode of Open Mics with Dr. Stice. And today we're focusing on epilepsy. It's a brain disorder and it causes reoccurring unprovoked seizures. For many people living with the condition, it's hard to live a normal life, never knowing when that next seizure will hit. But here's the great news. There are new ways to help people who have epilepsy. And we're gonna talk about that today. I am so delighted to welcome some very special guests this morning. We have Alex Crawford with us, who lives with epilepsy, and he's wonderful. We've been chatting about pirates and camp and everything this morning. His mom, Gina, is beside him as they join us this morning. Along with us in the studio, Dr. Carol Ujoa, an epileptologist and director of the Comprehensive Epilepsy Center here at the University of Kansas Health System. And we are also delighted to have Dr. Jennifer Chang, a neurosurgeon here at the health system. We have a stacked cast, so thank you to all of you for being here. Dr. Joe. I wanna start with you. Right out of the gate, what causes a person to have epilepsy? Is it something you're born with? And then when did the symptoms start? Uh, well, first, good morning, and thank you for having us here today as we observe um, Epilepsy Awareness Month in November. Um, so I wanna back up a little bit and just say what seizures are. And so basically, our nerve cells are always communicating and that's how we control our, our body and the things we want to do. And that's all, you know, voluntary. With seizures, there's this involuntary communication of the nerve cells that are um, hyperactive. And so that can cause a variety of symptoms. And so epilepsy is essentially someone that has seizures. Their brain has a tendency for seizures. The causes are, are many. Um, one big um, area is genetic, and so sometimes it's passed on in families. Um, other times it's just within that individual's genetic makeup, and it's not necessarily that they have um, a sibling or a parent with epilepsy. And then really anything that affects the brain, the structure of the brain. So for example, um, as the brain is forming in the womb, if um, things don't go exactly as they typically uh, should, we call those um, malformations of um, cortical development that can cause epilepsy. And then things like stroke, uh, traumatic brain injury, a brain infection, things that um, affect the brain in that way can all cause epilepsy. Do you know what causes it in a specific person? We're gonna get to, to Alex in a minute, one of your favorite patients who's sitting right beside you. Are you able to go back and figure that out? Yes, so I think that's one of our main goals when we first meet a patient. And um, I would say a, a great portion of time we are able to know the why, but there are still um, times where, where we don't. But we really have to do our best to try to figure out the why. Um, and what we find is a lot of times patients we see here Often they've been seeing other physicians, um, other neurologists throughout their life and have had MRIs that were read as uh, normal. But we find that with our expertise and the higher quality um, uh, MRI, often we're able to find uh, a lesion. And so we looked at this and studied this and about 30% of the time when patients come in um, being told they had normal MRIs, we actually find an abnormality that is known to cause epilepsy. I wanna go now to Alex and Gina. Um, Alex, you're 30 years old. You've been living with epilepsy for a very long time. So I want to ask you and your mom, how do you feel today? And what has this journey been like for you? Alex, I'll start with you. How are you feeling today? Well, I am, uh, I don't really know um, uh, when I'm going to have a, a seizure, uh, but um, uh, um, there are some uh, pretty um, uh, well. It's it's kind of hard to explain. Um, I I uh, I. Uh, Why don't you tell them what it's like living with your uh, seizures? Uh, uh, How's that been for you? Yeah. Well. Um. Uh, well. It hasn't really been an easygoing life. I, I am. Um, uh, I didn't really have any freedom. I, 
I am, uh, I had to have a res some restrictions, um, the, and I wasn't able to go to some summer camps, uh, it, it wasn't really, um, uh, easy, um, uh, going about it. One of the things that's remarkable talking to you, Alex, is that you have survived so much. And Gina, you are really a duo. And not only that, Alex also happens to be living with a couple different things that might make it make add more layers to his care. Alex is also living with autism. Um, Gina, has that also impacted how you're able to navigate going through this journey with him? Yes, because Alex started, because he started having seizures so young, um, it was really difficult for him to know when he was going to have a seizure because everything felt normal to him. It wasn't a new experience for him. It, it just is who he, who he was. Mm -hmm. um, the autism made it a little more difficult um, just trying to uh, get information from him um, for the doctors. Uh, sometimes we ask questions and he's uh, got very, he's very literal. So mm -hmm. it's sometimes hard to get the actual information you need. So as he got older, that got a little easier. I do remember he had his first surgery and they were testing to see how close this area was to his speech center. And um, they had a list of questions and they would stimulate the brain. If he couldn't answer, it was too close to the speech and we mm -hmm. wouldn't be able to do anything. And the first question they gave him was, say the alphabet starting with O, and he kind of got a blank look on his face and we were all kind of drooping and all of a sudden it hit me. The only alphabet Alex knows starts with A. He doesn't right. know the alphabet starting with O. Right. So we kind of have to sometimes restructure different tests they give him because it's hard, uh, just because the way his brain works a little differently. It works, but it just works a little differently. Totally. And so um, once they did that, we were able to get through the tests and we did, he did end up getting to um, have some surgery that did give him a little um, that release. Makes, so. That makes so much sense. Um, so how old was Alex when he first started having seizures? He was two days short of being six months old. Oh, wow. And yeah. then how often did they happen? Um, well, when he was a baby, he had that first one. It was like a 30 minute seizure. That was oh. horrible. Um, but after that, um, it first started, well, whenever he had a fever, he was going to have a seizure. Um, and then it went on to, you know, a little bit more where some, every once in a while we would have a seizure and we weren't, we, we thought we got overheated or, or something like that. But what we've come to realize is that for some reason, whenever he gets really excited or he's having a lot of fun, mm -hmm. he's going to have a seizure. Oh, that's um, a nasty twist. Yeah, right? but so, um, yeah. lately we've discovered some therapies that we use and they've been so successful and um, it's just been a really uh, life-changing time for Alex these last couple years. I want to bring in Dr. Ujoa because, well, for two reasons. One, you are his epileptologist, but two, Alex just lit up when we told him you'd be sitting next to him out here. And to see the bond that you and Alex have, uh, you first saw him as a patient eight years ago. Can you talk us through the treatments and procedures that Alex has undergone in his life and how they might have, how they helped each step of the way? Yes, so Alex has had more procedures than probably, you know, the vast majority of the patients that um, we take care of. So before I met him, he'd had another care team and they pinpointed the seizures to a, a part of his left frontal lobe, uh, did a surgery to remove some of that. And with that surgery, he went from having about two seizures a day to every five days he would have a seizure. Mm -hmm. So there was um, certainly improvement. Of course, you know, every five days is still a lot of seizures, especially when um, for him, it, it was always the big seizures, what they used to call grand mal. Um, the convulsions, you know, where you fall and shake and stiffen, and those are the most serious type. So um, the care team at that time also uh, placed a vagus nerve stimulator, or VNS, that um, helped a little bit additionally. I met Alex in 2015, very soon after starting here, and, um, and I just felt like we still needed to do more and we likely could do, could do better. Um, and so with the support of his parents, um, we basically started from scratch, did all the pre-surgical testing again, 
and still it appeared his seizures uh, were origi originating in the left frontal region. Um, he had electrodes placed within the brain, so it's um, rather than being on the scalp, they were actually within the brain to really pinpoint the seizure area. And um, we pinpointed it, it was close to language. So he did have further part of the left frontal lobe removed. And during parts of the surgery, so in the operating room, he would have to be woken up to test his speech. Um, we did that with the help of Dr. Pearson, our neuropsychologist. It's a, a tricky thing to do. We don't have to do it often, but um, Alex, actually did excellent, um, I, and I think it's, it was something pretty challenging. Um, with that surgery, um, by my account, it's about it was a 40% further decrease in his seizures, so he certainly got better, but we still wanted to do more. Um, so in 2018, um, you had the responsive neurostimulator, the RNS device placed, and that device, which I think Dr. Cheng will be telling you about further, over time, it gets better. It's like it gets smarter. We're able to tell it when to um, stimulate with um, better accuracy. And so between the combination of the surgeries, the device, um, and some adjustments in his medications, really over the last two to three years, it's, again, what I had in the, my documentation was like two to five seizures a year. So that's from two a day um, wow. to several a year. So that was extremely exciting. It's huge, and we're gonna get to everything that's brought into Alex's life, including camp, in just a minute. But first I wanna bring in Dr. Chang, because Dr. Chang, you implanted that device in Alex's brain called the responsive neurostimulator. How does that work once it's inside the brain? Um, yes, sure, thank you. Um, so the responsive neurostimulator device um, is implanted uh, into the brain, so part of it consists of electrodes that are placed either on, on the brain tissue or in the brain tissue where the seizures start. And then those electrodes are, are, are connected to a generator or otherwise called a battery that is implanted into the skull. Um, so in this diagram here, you can see that uh, that thing on the right side is the generator. Um, and so what happens is that uh, this reads the brain activity. It records the brain activity. Um, and when there is a seizure event, um, the brain activity becomes very abnormal. There, there is a lot of abnormal, very excitable activity that the device can sense. Um, and when it senses a seizure, the device sten sends a electrical stimulation back to the brain to stop the seizure from progressing. So is this suitable for all epilepsy patients? Uh, so it's currently not generally used for all types of epilepsy patients um, for one reason um, is that it, it, cannot, it can be less effective than a surgery where we remove the brain tissue that's causing the seizures. In Alex's case, we have an overlap between the area of the brain causing the seizures and his language areas. So if we were to remove that area of the brain to control the seizures, we would be uh, completely, we would be damaging his ability to speak. So uh, it, often in cases such as this, where the, the brain tissue is very functional, we may consider the use of the responsive neurostimulator device. This is really fascinating, and we just have to give props to Alex, because Alex, you were saying ahead of the start of this program, you used to be afraid of needles and didn't like going to the doctor, and here you are, you had brain surgery, you're not afraid of needles at all anymore, and a huge thing is now you're going to camp every summer. How cool is that? You must feel amazing. Yes, I um, uh, do, but um, uh, um, it's uh, it it pretty much is um, uh, a little um, uh, frustrating because. Um, uh, like I in said, it uh, it hasn't really been um, uh, easy. Um, but you've come uh, a long, you've come um, a long but, way. But uh, I have um, come a long way since then. So, um, why don't you tell uh, about all uh, the things you can uh, do now uh, that you couldn't so, do before? Uh, uh, um, so uh, I. I, uh, 
I am uh, uh, sorry. Sorry. Don't be just, sorry. Okay. We're in front of a lot of bright lights here. You're doing awesome. Uh, uh, so he used okay. to not uh, be able to stay by himself. Mm -hmm. He used to have to have um, someone yeah, with him all the time. Uh, yes, I yes I did. Um, because uh, um, because uh, I like I am uh, said earlier. Um, uh, it's I mean. I pretty much had restrictions. Mm -hmm. and most wasn't really um, uh, able to go outside, uh, uh, and and now what and, can you do? But now I can, and I uh, I'm able to um, uh, um, swim with. Uh, a, um, I mean, swim in a pool without a life jacket. Mm -hmm. I, I am uh, can stay home alone. Mm -hmm. I. Where else do you get to go? I uh, and I get to go to summer camp mm -hmm. and um pretty much uh, whenever we're out at the lake, mm -hmm. um. I can go um, uh, mm, mm, um, tubing, tubing as well. Oh, yeah. you can go tubing. We That's got cool. Got to go tubing mm -hmm. for the. He's always watched his uh -huh. um, siblings and cousins tube. Uh, he never got to go tubing, but this uh, past summer, got to go tubing. Hey, a lot of people don't like tubing because of the whip arounds, but yeah. you you like that. You like the wild ride of he, the tubing. Yes. Get to hang on and get whipped around the lake. Yep. Um, e e Yes, um, because uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I actually have figured um, out how uh, how to work the waves. Yep. Um, uh, yep. I um, I can um, uh, just um, uh, uh, um, hang on uh, to the um, uh, tube by um, uh, moving. Um, in the um, uh, actual direction yeah. of whichever way the wave's coming from. Yeah. So that's usually yeah. what people don't do. Yeah, because you get He's scared. So you figured fire. out how to like redistribute your weight. He's mastered the tubing and yes. how to last the yes. longest he, on the tube. I think he watched enough. Uh, what that's the awesome. Kids are doing. He figured out how to do it. But, so yeah. Gina, this must be so cool as a mom to see your son. You know, he was. That's your little boy. No matter Alex, even when you're 100 years old, your mom's still going to see you as your baby because that's what moms do, right? Yeah. Now to see your boy grow up to be a man who's going to camp and tubing and swimming that must you and and have independence that must be incredible yeah it's it's been like i said this has been a life changing couple of years for us um alex's whole life um like we were talking earlier christmas uh, he had his first christmas where he didn't have a seizure oh, and cool. that you know he was 31 years old so oh my gosh. you just that just you know as a as a parent um, it's sad when your child is at his happiest, bad things tend to happen. Right. So, um, sorry, for me that's been the most joy I've gotten is watching him enjoy things and not have seizures. And right. uh, so that's been, that's been, like I said, the for us, our whole family, it's been a joy watching Alex get to be, do fun things and be joyful and not worry that it's just gonna come crashing down on him, so. Well, I can't think of anything more cruel for a parent when you said at the beginning of the program that when he was at most elated as a child was when you knew a seizure was coming on, somehow those two came together and mm -hmm. that just seems so unfair. And now to have that freedom to feel joy and not have that happen is incredible. Right. Dr. Cheng, do you continue to see Alex? Uh, so actually, um, no, <laughs> Which is good. he doesn't have to see me, um, right. so we, um, I think more recently we replaced the device battery, mm -hmm. the responsive neurostimulator device, so that was a simple outpatient surgery um, that was just working under the scalp to replace that generator that was implanted in his skull, um, and then we, we saw him in follow-up to make sure that the incision was healing well, but um, he's, he's doing well and he doesn't have a need for no, more surgery at this time, so uh, that's why he just follows with Dr. Ochoa. 
you, you want to keep seeing Alex, but not as a patient. You just right. want to keep seeing him yes. because he's, he's yes. fun to hang out with. <laughs> Dr. Ujoa, does Alex take any medicine now as part of his ongoing treatment? He does. He takes quite a bit of medicine. So he's on five anti-seizure medications. Um, we have tweaked those for, you know, as long as I've known him. And I think for him, um, you know, everybody's journey is different. And I think for some patients, um, you know, one procedure or one aspect of the treatment is what really makes um, changes everything. But I feel like for Alex, it's been sort of these building blocks that have worked together. So luckily he tolerates the medicines very well. I, we are always talking about side effects and what to look out for. And um, you know, if, if another person took as much medicine as he did, they might not feel well, but, um, but he tolerates them quite well. I also just wanna take a quick moment to say that um, it's, it's a joy that like it's the best part of my job to be able to hear, you know, when you guys would come into the office and you told me about that first Christmas, or you told me about, you know, the what you were able to do at the lake that you weren't able to do before, and most of all, that you were alone because, I mean, imagine if you could never be be alone. Right. We all need to be alone sometimes. Um, so it's just an honor to to experience that with you. And to have your independence. We are here to answer all of your questions. We know our viewers have some excellent questions. You can reach us on YouTube, Facebook, the X platform. You can email the Medical News Network. We're answering your questions in real time. We're gonna to get to those in just a moment. So not only does Dr. Stites have the day off though, so does Dr. Dana Hawkinson. I wonder where those two guys are today. Maybe they're out somewhere having fun together. We wanna to remind everyone that this week's COVID count here at the health system is 15. So we've been going anywhere between 15 and 20 patients for the last several weeks. Both Dr. Stites and Dr. Hawkinson will be the first to remind you to stay up to date on your vaccinations, flu shot, make sure you're current on your COVID vaccine as well. And with that, let's get to the questions. Do we have any reporters on the line today? No reporter questions, so let's get right to our community questions because we have several. Jean has an interesting question. Dr. Ujoa, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. It happened in pop culture, but can you say anything about the recent seizure that Brooke Shields had? She attributed it to dehydration. No, she attributed it to overhydration, drinking too much water. Is yes. that possible? It is, and so, you know, not treating her, not knowing all the details of the situation, um, we, if it's provoked by something like that, that is not expected to happen again, as long as you don't drink another, you know, two gallons of water, um, that's not epilepsy. Epilepsy is when your brain has a higher tendency than average to have seizures, and you don't need any external factors okay. for it to happen. And so we call that a provoked seizure. And, um, and yes, um, there is, you know, a, 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 everything in excess can be bad. So even water, and so if you drink way too much water, your sodium can go down. And when it's down significantly, that, that can provoke a seizure. Well, how much is too much water? I, I gotta ask because I carry one of these around all day. And I feel yes. like if I finish this as a good day, is this too much water? Well, that's a good question. Typically we say like eight, eight ounce, you know, glasses. Okay. You also have to remember you get, you get fluids and water in your food. So things like fruits, you know. That counts that, that as have water? water. It, it does. Okay. Um, and then you also have to take into account the amount of like salt that you take in because the salt and water is, is a balance. Um, so if a patient's having like a no salt diet and they're having, you know, like I said, you know, two gallons of water, that's, that's probably gonna be too much. Scott, but it's very, I would say it's individualized. Individualized, okay. Uh, Scott has a question for Alex. Scott wants to know, Alex, where do you go to camp? Um, I go to Wonderland Camp. Um, it, it's, um, uh, it's pretty much a, um, uh, a, a, um, it's at, a, a, it's at, the, a, um, uh, at the Lake of the Ozarks. Ozarks. Yeah. Um, it, they also have um, uh, different themes, but uh, I prefer to go to the um, uh, pirate theme. Um, uh, um, you every love pirates. Summer. Yeah, I highly recommend it if if somebody's got a, a the Wonderland. Uh, camp. Uh, yeah, has a even a young adult. They're all ages there. It There's no like age it. restrictions. It's a great. It's a wonderful camp. Yeah. 
Yen Liang has a question for our doctors. Yen would like to know, would a stroke ultimately cause or lead to epilepsy? Dr. Ujoa, Dr. Chang, who wants that one? I mean, it's, it, I would say it's just a yes. It, okay. it can, it can. It increases your risk of epilepsy and it can happen immediately, you know, within days of the stroke, even hours of the stroke. Um, or it can happen delayed, you know, 10, 20 years after the stroke because those changes are, are there. The vast majority of people with, with strokes won't develop epilepsy, but it's absolutely a risk factor and we see many patients like that. Jeremy has a question. Jeremy wants to know, and, he, and this is really interesting, he writes, it seems like epileptic seizures are one of those things we have a lot of mistaken ideas about from movies, like swallowing your tongue or something which I thought is a myth. So tell us, is that true? And if someone you know has a seizure and you're panicking, what do you need to do to help that person if they're having a seizure? That's really interesting. I remember seeing in a movie once someone put a credit card in the person's oh, yeah. mouth to, w yeah. what's, is that a myth that you need to put something in their mouth? Um, not only is it a myth, but it's dangerous. Okay. Um, so really it's pretty simple. You want to make sure that the environment around the person is safe, that they're not gonna hit themselves. So, you know, lowering them to the ground, turning them on their side. That way, if there's a lot of saliva or even vomit, they won't aspirate it. Um, timing the seizure because past five minutes we consider that a medical emergency where you know you need to call 911 um, and so really it's just an overall keeping the person um, safe and keeping an eye on 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 the watch you don't want to put any you cannot swallow your tongue that's not a thing okay. a seizure can definitely affect your breathing but not not because of the tongue and then Stuart has a question how dangerous are seizures if someone's having a seizure and no one's around to see it or help them, how dangerous is that situation? Well, um, you know, I think it's actually a quite a loaded question because I think when you ask doctors this 20 years ago, and I see many patients like this, a, a parent that asked their doctor, you know, what, is it dangerous to have a seizure? And many of them tell me that they were told no. And so I think we have moved away from that quite a bit. Um, it, is, it is rare to die from a seizure, but, but we know it's possible both through injuries and drowning, but also um, through something called SUDEP, um, Sudden Unexpected Death in Epilepsy, which it's a hot area of research right now, and, and we find that it's cardiopulmonary, you know, the, the, how the lungs and your breathing and oxygen are altered and how your heart rate is altered, that can lead to that. And so, again, death and epilepsy is um, luckily an in, infrequent in, in situation, but when, you, when you're an expert in it, you certainly see it happen. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I think the, the injuries. And then also the brain doesn't like to have seizures. So very commonly, if someone's seizures are not stopped, they will develop memory problems. That's probably the most common issue that we find um, long term. And if you don't stop them, that can just kind of gradually get worse. Interesting question from Jean. And Jean, this is for Gina. Mm -hmm. uh, Jean wants to know if you ever discovered there was a connection between the epilepsy and the autism, or are they completely unrelated? Um, well, at first we were told that they're unrelated, but with Alex, Alex was originally diagnosed with Asperger's at the Asperger's syndrome. Cause that's what it was back in. He was he was uh, he was seven, six or seven years old when he got diagnosed with autism, and um, then we were told that if you take the general population, the number of people in the general population that, de that have epilepsy is lower than if you look at just the autistic population, that that percentage is higher. So nobody's ever come out and said, yes, that mm -hmm. that's what caused it, but there seems to be a higher likelihood of, a higher likelihood that you could have epilepsy and autism at the same time. We've discovered several people that wow. like Alex have autism and their children also. Their epilepsy isn't as severe as his right. is, but yeah. This is such a fascinating discussion and I'm so grateful to all of our guests for being here. Alex, thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, I wanna ask everyone for their final thoughts as we wrap this up. Alex, I'm particularly interested though in a pirate joke that you told me before the show began of you wear this T-shirt on St. Patrick's Day. Um, yes, uh, I. I actually wear a shirt that 
um, says, I'm Irish. Or I'm Irish. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, we have the same sense of humor. I think it's funny. He does like that shirt. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. you have a pirate uh, t-shirt for every day of the week? Uh, y yes. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Just for camp. Uh, uh, yeah, just for camp. And, uh -huh. um, uh, and, and um, it, well, uh, and, uh, and, sorry. <laughs> Don't be <laughs> sorry. Oh, my gosh. We're in the home stretch. You're, You're doing awesome. I, All right, bud. I, uh, yeah. You do like your pirate shirts. Yes, it's, I, I do. Um, uh, it, it's, um, it, I uh, have um, uh, one for every single um, uh, day that, yeah. um, uh -huh. uh, that, that I'm camp. at camp. Yeah. Okay. Mom, Gina, that must be just awesome. What would be your final thoughts as we wrap up this discussion for, our, for people watching? Um, I, I think I'm, I'm just so thankful that we came here, that we came to the University of Kansas. We came uh, 25 years ago um, with, and, so, and really glad that we found you all because um, we, like I said, our, our lives have been so different this last two years and um, we see Alice becoming more independent and, and if anybody knows anyone who's looking, this is a great place to come. I don't, I don't know that um, where we would be had we not come right. here. So it's, it's great watching your son become independent like he is. So, Dr. Ujoa, you, you've said that this is one of probably the favorite part of your job is seeing people living their full best lives. Anything you want to say to Alex or to Gina? Thank you. Like I mentioned earlier, it's it's really an honor to watch you grow. Um, and then I want to say thank you to Dr. Chang because I'm, I feel very lucky to work with her. Um, she's excellent. There's not um, too many um, women uh, neurosurgeons, and so I'm very proud that we have one of the best here. You, you, you can say it. Yeah. You can say it. Oh, and one of the patients I worked with said, called her a badass, and I, I just think it's the best term for her. <laughs> it's the highest compliment I think you can yes. give another woman and a doctor like Dr. Chang. I mean, you are, let's face yeah. it. Dr. Chang, what would be your final thoughts for viewers watching? Um, yeah, I, I definitely agree that um, I think one of the things we always want to emphasize is that epilepsy uh, can be treated. Um, if, you're, if you're on medications, but that's not treating your seizures well enough, um, it's good to seek uh, care at you know, some place like KU, so some place where they have a comprehensive um, epilepsy program and that we can really try to investigate the different ways that we could treat the epilepsy. And uh, this field is growing so much, there are so many changes. The devices, like the responsive neurostimulator device, are relatively recent. So it's very exciting to be in this field and to be able to help take care of patients like Alex. Well, thank you so much to all of our guests for joining us. Alex, thank you for sharing your journey. And as we wrap up this discussion, remember, as Dr. Stites always says, faith, hope, and science. And I'll see you back here tomorrow on All Things Heart. Years after facing two major heart issues, this doctor got a devastating blow. I'm Alexis Del Cid on the next All Things Heart, how he went from making end of life plans to fulfilling his lifelong dreams, thanks to his cardiologist right here at the health system, Thursday at 8 a.m. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stide's podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.